And you don't have to be in any special meditation position. There might be a position that you're used to sitting in. But that doesn't always work in every session. So just ask your body what it really needs now to be most at ease. And also a position that helps you to stay fairly alert. So you're not lying down in the same position that you go to sleep in, for example. But you can lie down on the side or in a different position if you wish, or lean against a wall or perhaps at a slight angle. So just really welcoming yourself into this shared space, sensing that we're practicing together. But there is a slightly different feeling from when we practice alone. And also that you are in your own little inner world as soon as you close your eyes. And all the sounds of the day, conversations, maybe arguments, maybe laughter. And the impressions of sight have all faded away. So that the most predominant sense is now the sense of physical touch. Your body is giving you feedback about how comfortable and at ease it feels. So really listen in, so to speak. The feeling part of the mind. Just checking through the body and seeing if there's anything you can do to bring about more comfort. Making sure there's plenty of space your ankles so that they're not squashed up against the other one or against the shin. Your buttocks are not squeezed or compressed. And that the weight is fairly even between the two. That your spine is a little bit free. I just noticed mine was slightly scrunched over. So I'm just stretching it out, feeling into each vertebrae. Giving it a little bit more space. I'm sensing the shoulders. Allowing them to relax. Perhaps adjusting them slightly or rolling them back very gently. Maybe as a consequence then just shifting your hands slightly. So that you're not pressing into your wrists. Your fingers all have enough space. Not tightly held together interlaced. And then noticing the neck and the head, allowing the head to just really rest into the neck, feel held. And letting all the facial muscles melt downward. Releasing any tension in the jaw. Tightness in the eyes or the brow. You can even imagine yourself massaging the brow outwards. 
imagining all that tension just releasing into the atmosphere. So now to increase our sense of ease and well-being, I'd like to suggest just a little imagination. You may use visualization if you wish, or just evoke a felt sense <coughs> of sitting in the presence of somebody who is really deeply compassionate, who looks upon you with loving eyes, deeply concerned for your well-being. The way perhaps a mother might look upon her child There's so much tenderness, sympathy and concern. You may bring to mind a teacher, if you have a teacher in your life, or an elder or a close friend who represents these qualities. Or you may imagine that you're sitting in the presence of the Buddha himself. This great gentle being with so much compassion and wisdom. And genuine care. not concerned with judging you, assessing you, pointing out your faults, but only concerned that you come out of suffering and experience the peace and the deep contentment that he's experienced in his own mind. Sensing yourself relaxing in this benevolent presence. Imagining the Buddha's gaze coming right into your body, suffusing you with kindly eyes and turning those eyes of kindness in on yourself. And suffusing your whole body with kind awareness.
looking upon yourself the way a Buddha might. If you wish, you can go through the body, part by part. Feeling any sensation that comes to mind on the way. And understanding those sensations as impermanent, arising just to pass away. Giving them importance, giving them care, then allowing them to pass, to fade. If the breath comes to mind, regarding the breath with the same kind, gentle awareness, allowing each breath to enter in its own time. Feeling it all the way to the end of the in-breath. Noticing the space before it naturally moves out all on its own. Being breathed Noticing what happens to the sensations in the body, to the experience of breathing. When you meet it with such a kind and gentle mind. Just as you relaxed in the presence of the Buddha teacher or a friend, the breath and the body relax in the presence of your beautiful, calm, benevolent mind. No more fighting with reality. Just making peace. Being kind and being gentle with whatever arises in your body and mind.
See if you can notice the delight as the mind settles, the body relaxes, and you remain present with the breath, even for just a simple breath. A simple calm joy is what the Buddha is encouraging us to experience. At first we might not notice it clearly. But after some time, we start to tune up as though with a different frequency of delight.
So as we're coming towards the end of the meditation, just inviting you to expand your awareness to take in the whole body. Reconnecting with the sense of the body sitting. And noticing how your body feels now. Noticing the quality of the mind. Whether it's more peaceful than when you began. Or not. I'm just reflecting on why. What kind of ways of looking led to peace? And what led to more agitation or resistance, tension or tightness in the mind? So this way of reflecting, I learned from my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, and it just helps to us to understand that meditation isn't something we're either good at or not, but rather it's a process of putting the causes and conditions in place for peace to arise. And when we reflect, we know that nothing's wasted. We're learning all the time more about the practice. So I'll end the meditation. I do a little short blessing chant just to send some loving kindness out to all of you and to all beings. Meta Karuna Mudita Upeika 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 I'll ring the bell and at the end of the third ringing you can open your eyes if you wish. Good. Good. So it's funny, I looked at the screen 
a couple of times and I kept thinking, Mel is really still. So I can just see this photo, but it looks like you're really there, Mel, but you're dead still. <laughs> so today it was called something like uh, the role of good friendship in the path. And as I mentioned earlier, the Buddha is our best friend in the practice, obviously, because he points out the path. And I think sometimes as Westerners, we're often attracted to Buddhism because of the uh, idea that this is a path that we can do, right? We are our own master. So we walk the path and we have to decide, you know, whether we're walking correctly or not. And um, generally it's something that we feel, we depend quite a lot on our um, critical mind, I think, and our ability to investigate and analyze experience. And that's all very good and it gives us a great advantage, especially if we can develop these deep states of samadhi and then use the power of that to investigate. But also there is a particular path and the Buddha didn't say, you just go ahead and work it out for yourself. He actually said the Buddha points out the path, but you yourself have to walk on that path. So unless he actually points that out, I think it's very, very unlikely any of us would be here right, if we hadn't heard of the Buddha's teaching. And a deeper level of why this is so important is because it's pointing to the fact that we're entirely a product of our conditions and our conditioning, yeah? There's no abiding self, abiding entity that's eternal and everlasting and unchanging, yeah, or fixed in its course inside us at all, yeah? Everything that we are is a product of all we've experienced, all we've read about, the ways we've been raised, our schooling, you know, our parenting, the friendships that we've chosen. Um, I mean, the religious backgrounds that we have. I mean, why is it that some people born in one country are Catholic and other people born in another country might be Muslim or Hindu? That's not our personal choice. That's because we've been conditioned by the society we live in and we take on those understandings and um, beliefs sometimes. Of course, sometimes we also question them. But we need to come into contact with um, another way of looking in order to have our conditionings um, shifted and, and changed in any way, right? Otherwise, we're just rolling on as a product of that conditioning without even realizing it. So yeah, my teacher, one of my teachers, Ajahn Brahmali, he said it's fundamentally important to realize this. And also to develop the association with the wise because by doing that we almost get i like the way he puts it he says we get um carried in the tailwind yeah so it's like there's an airplane or something and if you're carried in the tailwind i mean that's quite dangerous if, if another airplane is there but if you're carried in the tailwind of a very noble person or an enlightened person then it leads in a very good direction and it's for this reason that the um, Buddha actually went so far as to say that spiritual friendship is the whole of the spiritual path, right? The whole of the spiritual path. And we'll get into more about that later, but I wanted to talk at first about a little bit just about how we're conditioned by our um, upbringing, etc., and the impact that this can have. You know, so obviously um, babies, I think there was some research done on babies who were brought up in very loving and stably, um, consistently safe environments. And at the neurological and psychological level, um, some research was done to find out that um, these children, these um, yeah, children raised in that kind of loving environment, were somehow immunized by love against, for example, things going very badly wrong in later life, they found that there was more emotional resilience in these people than there was in, for example, people brought up in more traumatic um, situations, especially situations of abuse, right, or neglect. There was a difference in the way that their minds and even at the level of the brain was um, developed, yeah? And this sounds maybe a little bit kind of worrying because what if we haven't had particularly good upbringings, but it doesn't really, I mean, it might affect us, but there are things we can do about it later in life. And the same um, research, I think it was a man called Johan Harry, he did a lot of work with people with addictions. And he said that the opposite of addiction is not, is not um, you know, 
not being addicted or being well adjusted or anything like that. He said the opposite of addiction is connection, which I found really fascinating because basically what he was saying is that if you feel a sense of self-worth, a sense of being valued by your parents, by your society, whatever it is, um, then you will feel more connected and there'll be less likelihood of, of going into things like addictions when things go wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's often the case that um, it's a lack of belonging or a lack of um, feeling attuned to one's worth, feeling loved, that means people are more vulnerable to being involved in, say, like terrorist groups or just falling in with the wrong crowd, right? And so you can look at those people and think, oh, there's something wrong with them. Why are they so cruel? Why are they sort of so badly behaved? But who knows what would have happened if we'd have had a similar upbringing? I tend to think that we would be in the same boat, you know. And this gives me great hope because if we are so conditioned by our environment, we can actually learn to put in the wise conditions to condition ourselves in a wholesome way, yeah. Yeah. And also when, when we're modeled with things like love, you know, our parents or our friends model love to us, it gives us that sense of how to love ourselves and then as a consequence, how to love others. Right. And I was very lucky growing up because I had quite a nice family. I mean, it was a stable upbringing and also a very close best friend. And we also always used to share everything we had. You know, if one of us had sweets or chocolate bar or something like that, we'd always split it exactly half half. <laughs> and even the Buddha talked about this as one of the qualities of, of a friend that they always share what they have they share any gains they even share the contents of their plate of food you know and he spoke about various other qualities of a friend as well which I could really relate to so some of them are um, from the anger to a seven and he said that a friend gives what's hard to give does what's hard to do forgives your harsh words yeah, this is really important in a friend or a spiritual friend that they can actually see beyond our little mistakes and the things that we do when we're in a bad mood and maybe understand that, oh, we were actually tired that day or perhaps we had some stress that they didn't realize about. So we forgive more easily and we endure what's hard to endure. So that means they don't just sort of leave you when the going gets tough, right? And they tell your, their secrets and preserve your secrets, which I think is really lovely because it gives that sense of intimacy and trust. You know, it's not that um, we always have to keep everything to ourselves and sometimes we feel we might be saying negative things about another person. No, if you have a really close friend, they understand where you're coming from. And if you are sort of going into being overcritical, they might be able to point that out. But sometimes you want to just approach a good friend because they trust that you're trying to work it out for yourself. You know, sometimes I go to my teacher in that way if something's troubling me and I ask for his advice. And um, he just helps me to, you know, understand a person in a different way that actually leads to a relief of suffering in myself if I'm struggling with a person's behavior. And then um, also there's another passage in the Digha Nikaya, just for any Sutta freaks here. This is number 31 in the Digha Nikaya. And um, the Buddha talks about four types of kind-hearted friend. And one is that they're helpful. So this is things like they look after your property when you go on holiday. You know, they make sure that the dustbins are put out or whatever it is. And they share in your happiness and suffering. They're sympathetic. And there it's described in a bit more detail. It says, for example, if somebody else is blaming you and talking badly about you, a friend will actually try and stop them saying those unkind words. But if somebody's praising you to another person, they'll be very happy and delight in that and encourage that. And I think it's really nice in this case to see that it's not only relating to your particular friend. You don't only do that because it's your friend. But the idea is to actually do that no matter who somebody is talking about, right? So in another part of the sutta, the Buddha says that one of the qualities of right speech is to unite the divided and to promote harmony and concord. And this is one way of doing it, just to you know, point out people's goodness, not only to them, but to other people as well. So in a way, you're sort of just conditioning your mind to see more of the good. And of course, when somebody looks at the best in you, it has a tendency to bring that out. 
I know that that's always been the case with my good friends and also with my teacher, you know. He sees a potential in me and I'm sure in all human beings, otherwise he wouldn't be teaching, for liberation, right? And he sees that because he's experienced some of those benefits for himself. So he's not saying, well, you know, I'm so special, I'm so great, I went to Cambridge and I had, you know, just a natural tendency to get into deep meditation. Some people think that way and sometimes I think that way. But actually that's delusional because the only reason that, you know, he uh, made good progress in his meditation at a young age, seemingly at a young age, is because of all the qualities that he'd been developing previously, yeah, and the conditions that were fruitful for that. So it's really interesting, and he always really sort of um, discourages people thinking in terms of abilities or special qualities or skills, and understand that they are just, you know, you are a product of your conditioning, basically. Yeah. So there's a chance for everybody. And the beautiful thing about being around such wise teachers, of course, is that um, they are human beings, and you get to know them as human beings. And you think, well, if it's possible for them, perhaps, perhaps it could just be possible for me too. Apart from that, I think it can be a little bit, um, a little bit uh, remote, perhaps. You know, of course, the Buddhist texts are there, and this is wonderful, and we can definitely get a sense of the Buddha as a great, benevolent, compassionate, and incredibly wise human being. But you know, when you see photos and stuff, or, or depictions of the Buddha, not photos with a funny hairdo or whatever it's supposed to be. <laughs> Sometimes it seems a little bit far removed from our, from our um, own experience. We can't go and meet the Buddha, you know. Actually, in the suttas, they always spoke about the Buddha as um, looking quite ordinary. There were times that he turned up, there was a time in particular, when he turned up at a farmer's shed, and there was another monk there already. And the Buddha turned up, and this other monk didn't know who he was. And, uh, and the Buddha was very respectful. You know, again, he didn't think, well, I'm the Buddha, I should get to sleep on the best bell of hay. He turned up and asked the other monk, would it be okay, would it be disturbance if we were to share this place for the night? And the other monk said, no, no, certainly venerable, you can stay here with me. And the Buddha asked him, like, uh, what are you doing here? You know, where are you going? And he said, oh, I'm on a pilgrimage to meet my teacher. And he said to the Buddha, and the Buddha said to him, well, who's your teacher? And he said, oh, the great recluse Gautama the Buddha is my teacher. But he didn't have any idea that he was actually talking to the Buddha. So the Buddha didn't say anything at that point, but he just sat down cross-legged and meditated. And the other monk got inspired and thought, I'll also meditate. So they both stayed up all night practicing. Maybe the other monk was trying to sort of compete a bit, who knows. And by the time the morning came, the other monk thought, this is somebody special. And slowly it started to dawn on him <laughs> that he'd been sharing this, you know, farmer's hut and this uh, straw hut with the Buddha himself. So actually the Buddha didn't look any different. But still, I think it really brings things to life. And it certainly brought things to life for me when I met my first teacher who I had confidence in as having um, very deep insight and basically being an area. So somebody who's entered the stream. And until then, I understood the role of the teacher to a degree that they were there to kind of give teachings and maybe entertain you with their discourses and that they were very nice and friendly, loving people. But I didn't really get the power of being around somebody who's really broken through to something that I have yet to. And also this sense that they really know it's possible for you, right? <laughs> they really know that and they don't think that they're anything different, other, special, etc. And of course, the radiation that they tend to have of loving kindness and compassion is really incredible, just so that you sit in their presence and feel immediately relaxed and at peace. And that really takes a sense of loving kindness, friendship, trust to a different level. You know, this is something which is not reciprocal. It doesn't need to be reciprocal. With a friend, there's always a sense of reciprocity there, even if it's a very um, loving, forgiving, understanding friend. You're together because you share similar interests or you like to do similar things, yeah? You have good conversations or maybe you live close together. But with a spiritual teacher, the only thing they're interested in is your ultimate benefit, your real benefit, and they understand what that is, you know? And that basically involves the end of suffering, all suffering. So the only reason they're interested in teaching you is to help you come out of suffering. 
It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, whether you're male or female or anything else, you know, transgender, gay, bisexual, whatever. It just is completely irrelevant. They're concerned with suffering and the way out of suffering. And they can help you to understand that path. So the qualities that we look for in a teacher, are of course, very um, closely related to the qualities we look for in a friend, but then it moves more into the ethical realm. It moves more into the sphere of having good virtue, having confidence, yeah? Strong confidence in the teachings. If you're not the Buddha yourself or an Arya yourself, you already have a strong confidence, yeah? Also, you're very generous and full of compassion. These are definite signs of somebody who is a wise being. It's not only about themselves anymore. They give. They give so much. Just today, I was watching Ajahn Brown on the Vesak. And, uh, you know, he was there for the whole day in that empty hall. At one point, he was joined by Venerable Hasapanya, who's um, the senior nun at Dhammasara Monastery. She used to be my abbot when I lived there. And uh, he was joined by her for a while, but he was there for the entire day. And even the chanting that he did, he still did what we call the Parita chanting, which is sort of reciting the Buddhist text for about 15 minutes. And normally you'd have a whole row of monastics doing that. But he just did it himself to an empty hall, very careful, very mindful, you know, putting great love and care into every single word. And it's just so inspiring to see this. You know, he's getting no feedback from this at all. <laughs> but he's just there to give. And I could see him getting inspired as the day went by by reflecting on the qualities of the Buddha and the teachings of the Buddha. And it was very beautiful to watch. So I think another quality of a spiritual teacher for me is a sense of authenticity, a sense of not necessarily that they've, you know, become enlightened or have any particular special attainments, but just that they're very real. They don't try to be something they're not. Yeah. In the suttas, it says that as one practices, so one speaks. And as one speaks, that much one practices, right? So, of course, we can speak about stages we've yet to realize. But just to be aware that, you know, we don't kind of give people the impression that we've attained something that we've not yet attained, that we're very authentic. And I think somebody once said to me that the thing that stood out to them about Ajahn Brahm, I'm talking about him because he is, for me, my example of a spiritual friend, right? And a best, a really incredible, I mean, I feel incredibly fortunate to have contact with such a being and to be able to, you know, somebody who's so accessible, that I can actually talk to and talk to about so many different things. Obviously my practice, but also the project. And along with the project comes so many other things, the way we relate to others, the way we manage boundaries and uh, things that help with inspiration, whatever it is, you know, there's this beautiful, open, free-flowing channel of communication. And I feel I have nothing to hide from him at all because there's just this unconditional acceptance and something in him that sees my potential. And I don't take that personally, I just take that as a reflection of his own um, non-judgmentalness, because I know that he gives that trust and respect to everybody, you know, and it, you'd have to do something pretty, pretty awful really to lose that, <laughs> you know. Um, and you just want to live up to it if you have such a teacher. But yeah, one of the things about him is that he has this sense of spiritual integrity, you know. He puts his actions where his values are, so with things like the bhikkhuni ordinations, you know, he's not just speaking about equity and equality. He's actually going out there and doing something, even though that cost him at the personal level. So before I go too much on about that, because <laughs> not all of you may have a connection with Ajahn Brahm, um, I just wanted to say a bit more about why spiritual friendship is so key to the holy life and to the spiritual path in itself. Um, and the Buddha said, basically, when Ananda said to him, you know, spiritual um, friendship is half the holy life, he said, no, no, don't say that. Spiritual friendship is the whole of the holy life. But then he went further and said, this is why. He said that if a monk or a nun or anybody has a spiritual friend, a good friend, a good companion, it will be expected that they will develop and cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path. And how Ananda does a monk or a nun or a layman or woman with a good friend develop and cultivate the Eightfold Noble Path. And then he says here one develops right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, 
right effort, right mindfulness, all of which, oh sorry, and right stillness. So I'm translating concentration as stillness, as you know, I prefer that. And all of these are based upon seclusion, dispassion and cessation, maturing in release. Yeah. So again, often I think, especially as Westerners, we like to think, oh, let's get out into seclusion and work out our own path. You know, we are the master of our mind and all the rest. And we go off into seclusion almost as soon as we can. But actually what he's saying here is that we need that right friendship, first of all, to help us to understand what the path is. Yeah. And when we understand what the path is, then we have a chance to start to cultivate it. So the seclusion comes a little bit later. It's also, um, you can think of it as like the Buddha points out a map, yeah. So he's giving you a map for the practice. And this map really helps you to understand, first of all, where you're going, right? Because not all maps end up in the same destination. We might think that every spiritual person we hear about, Eckhart Tolle, or I don't know, Adyashanti, or this teacher or that teacher, they're all teaching the same. Jesus is teaching the same, the Buddha's teaching the same. Are you so sure about that? You know, are you really so sure about that? If you look closer at what the Eightfold Path is really pointing to, we need to be very clear about the map and where it's headed and what we actually want out of our spiritual life. Some people don't mind to go to the heaven realm and stay there for eternity. Personally, I don't want that. Personally, I want an ending of, of things, you know, because to me it's instinctive in a sense that any kind of existence entails suffering whether that suffering, whether that existence comes to an end and that's where the suffering lies or whether the suffering just in being eternal, <laughs> you know, even if you're in a, a bliss state the whole time, after some while, this is why when you go through the jhanas, the, the bliss starts to settle down and become quieter because the mind gets satiated and after a while, that's no longer pleasant anymore. The mind inclines more and more to more peaceful states. Yeah. And this is the whole process of the practice. We're going from certain kinds of happiness, which are fairly coarse, to a more refined happiness, which is more along the lines of peace and contentment. And later on, even that peace gets refined. Ajahn Brahm's the expert on this, and he'll talk about so many flavors of peace and so many flavors of bliss. And, you know, he, he always says, whatever you have now, just assume that there's something beyond that, right? <laughs> And don't get stuck there. Keep digging deeper, right? So the first thing is he lays out the path. And that is leading, as we said, to dispassion, to cessation, to release. But also it helps us to not get stuck in any dead ends, right? Or go down any by roads or, or even veer right off the highway, right off the middle path into the extremes. Whether indulging in, you know, sensory desire, sense pleasures, or just maybe not even indulging, but just getting kind of distracted with that or, or feeling that that's the best you can really get and there's nothing deeper than that. Or whether it's going into kind of pushing things a bit too hard. Yeah, this, this extreme of um, what they call self-mortification doesn't necessarily mean actually flagellating yourself, you know, with some kind of whip or, <laughs> or sleeping on the hard floor or sitting on concrete till your knees are about to give way. It also means any practice that wearies the body and mind, right, which causes tiredness. And I do have one practice like that, which is staying up a little bit too late sometimes. And I think that is something that I could help myself with and just bring myself a little bit more on track because I feel much better when I'm well rested than when I've stayed up too late. So, you know, this uh, my of the journey so to speak is so crucial and if you do work with a good teacher and you go to them with this experience or that experience they'll be able to point out where that is in the context of the whole path you know so often there's a lot of overestimation or we even mistake a certain experience for something that it's not I mean, obviously, that's very common now that jhanas are being understood to be states that are important in the path there are all kinds of different definitions of what constitutes a jhana. And I always think, well, it's fine. I mean, of course, there are different experiences we can have and any amount of stillness is a good thing. But then we don't have to call things which are a little bit less a jhana because we're not in this for attaining. The main thing is there's always something more we can still let go of, right? And as long as there is, then keep going. That's how I see it. I also think that if there was something deeper, the Buddha would have known it, right? 
or the teachers who are enlightened beings, they know something deeper. So if somebody's teaching something at a slightly deeper level, perhaps they know a little bit more, yeah? And they've probably gone through the previous stages already. So I personally found this incredibly helpful when I ordained in Burma because it was the first time I had a personal teacher and I'd go to my Sayadaw, Sayadaw Upanya Jota was his name. And I'd sort of explain what was happening thinking, well, I mean, there's nothing much to say. Okay, I'm sort of sitting here. Yes, I'm aware of everything changing. It's quite calm. I feel quite equanimous. What is there to say, you know? But I'd say that and he'd start to describe what had caused that, what might happen next, what to be on the lookout for, what kind of qualities may be necessary as things progress. And it was so fascinating to me that, you know, just that somebody could point this out and again, of course, it completely depersonalized the experience because I realized this is like a kind of natural phenomena, right? The path unfolds in a natural way. And also in the suttas, I mean, spiritual friendship is often at the beginning of a sequence of practice. So there's one sutta called um, ignorance. And in there, the whole path starts by associating with good friends. And the Buddha actually says that by associating with good friends, um, this fills up the next stage, and the next stage is hearing the Dhamma, right? Again, getting the map, getting the inspiration to practice. And when you hear the Dhamma, this leads into getting confidence, having confidence start to arise in the mind, yeah? And from here, there are lots of different sequences in the suttas. One of them goes from confidence into joy, into PT, the bliss, into stillness, into seeing things as they are. So it kind of goes through a whole um, description really of the path into the deep states of samadhi and beyond. And in this particular sutta, it goes from confidence to then having careful attention or wise attention, right? So again, first of all, we hear the teachings, we get the map, then we can start to investigate, right? Then we can start to use careful attention to go deeper with our own examination, with our own powers of investigation. And from there, we develop um, mindfulness. We develop guarding the senses, so virtuous behavior at the level of the senses and the body, speech, and mind. And then the four satipatthanas and the seven factors of enlightenment, again, leading to enlightenment, right? Leading all the way to freedom from suffering. So I find it so fascinating that, you know, all of this starts with wise friendship because it gives us that inspiration. And this is the second thing that I really wanted to point out, you know, from associating with wise beings. It's that sense of um, being inspired by seeing the Dhamma embodied in another person, you know, actually seeing the way that Dhamma manifests in life. There are just little things that stick in my mind, just simple things really about being around some of these wise beings. Like once I was in um, my monastery in Burma and I just went over to the dining room before lunch, maybe a bit early. And my teacher was just sitting on some stone steps and he'd um, cut his toe on the arms round because they used to go, you know, with bare feet and walk two miles to the village. And he was just very, very calmly putting this bandage on his toe. And I have never seen anything done with such gentleness as though he was, you know, putting this bandage on the most tiny little creature that would probably fall apart if you touched it, you know? It was just so calm and peaceful, really beautiful. And I've seen similar with Ajahn Brown. I mean, he has a lot of work. He's sometimes in his office all morning. But if you go in and you see what he's doing, He's actually doing really one thing at a time. Like whatever he does is extremely mindful and extremely peaceful, actually. You wouldn't really imagine that it was a place where, with a lot of internet happening. It's just very, very still and quiet and kind of easeful. Yeah. I mean, I've even had interviews in his office and stuff because it's just a nice place to be. <laughs> but more than that, I mean, just seeing the way these beings relate to others, for example, the way they answer questions or the way they respond if somebody comes up to them who's very agitated, <clears throat> which just kind of takes out the whole charge of that person's agitation. You know, they just respond with peace, with kindness, without buying into it, basically. And I think this is one big difference, isn't it, between sort of a spiritual friend who sees beyond your immediate mood 
um, and sees the bigger picture. And, and it's also not very phased by the various emotions and sort of weathers that the mind can go through. They know it all, they understand it, they've been there, you know. They have all been there. They've all been where we we are now, and uh, we will be where they are too. And this is the beautiful thing if we just keep practicing. So I really love these suttas because it makes the whole path seem like a very natural process. It depersonalizes it. It stops us thinking, you know, that there needs to be some special qualities within oneself in order to have any kind of success. And it also can be very helpful in the actual meditation. Sometimes I sit there and I actually imagine myself giving my practice away to the Buddha or away to my teacher. I say, right, you've put the conditions in my mind. I have the teachings, you do it. And I just sit there and imagine they're there. <laughs> and I just let everything happen. What usually happens is not very much. In fact, I stop doing anything. And I just sit there and things start to settle on their own. And that's really lovely, you know. Sometimes all it takes is to imagine that you're in this presence, like this sort of loving presence, which is kind of shining its light on you. Again, like this mindfulness and kindness, shining the light and warmth of the sun on a little tiny fern. And just watching that little fern gradually unfold and become a nice big open fern. And that's how the meditation sometimes happens. One last thing I'd just like to mention uh, before giving some questions is... Um, the power of gratitude, which is again another benefit of having a spiritual teacher or a wise friend, it instills this sense of gratitude. Yeah. And again, we realize we couldn't have done it without them. We couldn't have done it alone. Because of this, it's very humbling. Yeah. It takes away any sense of pride or you know, difference around anybody. And sometimes I have so much gratitude coming into my heart, I almost don't know what to do with it. The only thing I can do is meditate and take that feeling of gratitude inside and just say, wow, I have all these gifts, I have all these opportunities, let me at least give some quiet time so that those seeds can start to ripen. The seeds are there, so now all I need to do is give that space, give that time. And gratitude is such a beautiful quality, it kind of feeds into loving kindness, it feeds into contentment, right? When you're grateful, you don't need very much. You can really appreciate what's already right in front of you, whether that be another person or a particular plate of food <laughs> or even just a little breath, right? You're grateful for the little breath. The breath was given to us by the Buddha. How would we ever have figured that one out, right? That we should sit and watch our breath. I mean, <laughs> when we're born, we just take the breathing for granted. I mean, we don't even realize we're breathing most of the time. And here's the Buddha saying that if you just watch this breath, you'll get all the way into you know, the joys of meditation, you'll overcome the five hindrances and it'll take you into deep, deep understanding of the way things are, right? So even just grateful for one little breath. And when you're grateful, your mind tends to stay with things because it starts to value them much more. Yeah, it's when we don't really appreciate, we're not really grateful for what's right in front of us that we want to move on to the next thing or something better, another stage in the meditation. And yeah, lastly, I guess there's one more thing that's um, important to say is that this spiritual friendship also develops a harmonious community, right? So it starts perhaps with somebody that you relate to personally as your spiritual friend or maybe a group of people. Maybe a session like this where we're all starting to know each other and we feel spiritually connected. But then it can also translate into actual communities on the ground of beings who live together and support each other in their practice. And this is really, really important to keep us on track and to, in a way, I mean, nobody ever has like all the qualities in themselves, right? We're all different. We all have them in slightly different ways in slightly different proportions or degrees. And it's really wonderful to be around other people and be able to really respect and value those different qualities that they have. Some people's strengths are different than my strengths. My strengths are different than yours, you know? And when we're together in community, we can see that each of us have something very unique to bring into it, and yet none of us are better than others. We're all equal. So the Buddha always said that the sign or the um, conditions that conduce to that harmony are like thoughts, words, and actions of loving kindness, but also sharing everything equally, sharing one's food with the others, yeah? 
So this again implies equality. It's not that the senior monk gets more than the junior non. Although if you are at the back of the queue, you tend to get a bit less. So I'm still working on that one because <laughs> I shouldn't be at the back of the queue behind the junior monks. But anyway, we'll see what, what happens there. But uh, basically, you know, you're all getting the same facilities, the same treatment, regardless of who you are, regardless of your gender, your sexuality, your race, your background, your education. It doesn't matter in a monastery. This is one of the reasons we shave our head and put on the robes. We're all equal. <clears throat> okay? Not the same, but equal. And we all have our special qualities. And then the last two are the deeper ones. You know, we actually share in common virtues and virtue which is dear to the noble ones. So the beautiful virtues of the heart that come around through cultivating sila, right? Not killing, stealing, etc., but doing the positive aspect of that so living with real kindness for others real harmlessness and generosity and lastly he said the most important one actually for true harmony is that we share in common the view that is emancipating that is enlightening and that leads to the end of suffering mm -hmm. so for this we need a buddha we need the buddha to give us that right view at least in the beginning and once we set up on the right track we can, of course, deepen and refine our own understanding along the way through the power of wise attention. The Buddha said that there are two qualities necessary for stream entry. That's the first stage of enlightenment. One is the word of another. And that, again, is the word of an enlightened person. So if you don't know whether your teachers are enlightened, you know that the Buddha was. Hopefully you have that much confidence. So you can always go back to the text, to the Buddhist text. So the word of another is the one, and then yoni somana sikara, which is wise attention or careful attention that goes to the source of things, yeah? That goes deep inside to the true nature of impermanence, suffering, and non-self. So hopefully that has um, given you some understanding, more understanding, different understanding, perhaps, of spiritual friendship. And um, may we all continue to be a support for each other on the path. And may you associate with good, wise friends. <laughs>